Good morning. Good morning. Um, today we're going to uh, bless you. Today we're going to concentrate on our descriptive statistic number five, which, like I said, is, a pro is probably the most involved of our descriptive statistics. So this um, lecture is going to last about 65 minutes. It's chock full of really important information, so it's, it's really, really important that you pay close attention. By the end of the session today, you're, you're gonna, we're going to be, you know, uh, your head's going to be full of, of new stuff. This is very important, okay? Correlation is uh, called a bivariate statistic. It's a bivariate statistic. Um, up to now, with our first four descriptive statistics, we've been essentially dealing in the univariate world, the one variable one variable x, right? Now, we're going to be transitioning into the bivariate world, two variables. Correlation is the extent to which two variables change together in a systematic way. or what we call covary, or covary, the extent to which two variables change together in a systematic way, or covary, vary together, so to speak. Um, another way of saying this, it's the relationship between two variables. It's the relationship between two variables. Uh, or association. There's another, another term that they use. It's the relationship or association between two variables. And this relationship is linear. It's linear, and we know about linear relationships. We'll talk about that uh, down the road a little bit. Um, but let's just, just take a look. X and Y. Um, let's, call, let's call X exam one scores and Y exam two scores. Now, I've been teaching this uh, subject matter a long time, and I can pretty much tell you, based on the data I've gathered, you know, in terms of exam one and exam two, that um, uh, there's a pretty high correlation between exam one and exam two scores. In other words, for the most part, students score pretty similarly on exam two as they do on exam one. Sometimes there's a little bit of a difference, uh, but most of the time uh, there's a lot of similarity. So let's suppose we have six students. Student number one scores an 86 on exam one and 85 on exam two. Student number two scores a 79 on number one, 80 on exam two, uh, and so on. Let me just uh, write the numbers in here. We have a bivariate data set. And if we inspect this, we see it's, you know, it's pretty obvious that uh, these numbers are kind of similar. There's a lot of similarity here. If we had you know, an exam one score of 86 and exam two of like 13, right? Or you know, exam, exam one of 81 and exam two of uh, 47, or you know, whatever, the, you know, they would not be similar. So we see a lot of similarity here. Now we can actually compute this measure of relationship. We can compute this measure of relationship. And this measure is called a P 
Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. It's called a Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. And I will, I will write this once. called the Pearson product moment correlation coefficient. And of course, it's abbreviated Pearson R. The Pearson R, small r, it's a very, very extensively used measure of relationship uh, in science. And The range of Pearson R goes from positive 1 to negative 1 with um, 0 in the middle, of course. Correlations between 0 and positive 1 we refer to as positive correlations. Correlations between 0 and negative 1 we call negative correlations. And we'll talk about the characteristics of positive and negative correlations in a minute. But for now, I'd just like to point out that in terms of positive correlations, Correlation strength, correlation strength for positive correlations increase as positive correlations approach positive 1. Positive 1 is the strongest positive relationship that we can get. So, you know, a correlation of positive 0.75 is stronger in the positive sense than a correlation of positive 0.25. With negative correlations, correlation strength increases as negative correlations approach negative 1. So in terms of negative correlations, strength increases as negative correlations approach negative 1. So, Negative 1 is the strongest negative relationship we can have. A correlation of negative 0.75 is stronger in the negative sense than a correlation of negative 0.25. Positive and negative correlations. Now let's look at these positive and negative correlations. Bless you. We have positive correlations. And negative correlations. With positive correlations, we have simultaneous increase in x and y, or simultaneous decrease in x and y. We have simultaneous increase or simultaneous decrease in x and y. So we have this kind of stuff going on, either this or this. And what do I mean by that? Well, Let's think of some examples of positive correlations. Here we go. Let's, here's one. As um, study time increases, grades increase. Positive correlation. Um, as as um, dietary fat intake increases, 
body weight increases. Positive correlation. Uh, as, um, here's a good one. As sleep time decreases, energy levels decrease. Positive correlation. Any kind of a situation where as x increases, y simultaneously increases, or as x decreases, y simultaneously decreases. With negative correlations, we have the inverse relationship. As x increases, y simultaneously decreases. Or as x decreases, we have a simultaneous increase in y. So we have this kind of stuff going on. Okay. So let's think of examples of negative correlations. Um, let's see. As, uh, as sleep time decreases, irritability increases. Ooh, negative correlation. Let's think of another one. As, oh, here's a good one. Here's one um, they gave me back when I was an undergrad. As, um, as alcohol intake increases, scores on a manual dexterity test decrease. Negative correlation. Okay. Now, it's your job when you're, you know, brushing your teeth, doing your dishes, sitting at a stoplight or something. You know, I want you, you need to think of examples, as many as, as you can, of positive correlations and negative correlations. And I, I even have students in exams, they're literally sitting there going, you know, and, and it's good, it's good. Okay, now, correlations, both positive and negative, are displayed visually using uh, what we call scatter plots. The scatter plot. Correlations are displayed visually using scatter plots. So on the test, if I ask you a question, correlations are displayed visually using A, scatter plots, B, bar graphs, C, line graphs, D, histograms, which, uh, which one are you going to circle? Scatter. Very good. You get it right. But guess what? You would be surprised at the number of kids who like, and it's the ones, it's an indicator of just not studying, okay? That they won't get that one right. I mean, what, what, what more can I do as a teacher? Whose fault is it, you know, that you're failing the class? Is it mine? Is it something I'm not doing? No, something you're not doing. Okay. Scatter plots for positive correlations typically would look like this. We have a pattern. There's a bivariate statistical pattern. And in positive correlations, it's a pattern of like an ellipse or an oval or something like that. We have, you know, this elliptical configuration, so to speak. We have a pattern to the data. And in this case of the positive correlation, the data points are going up and to the right. Up and to the right, down and to the left. Up and to the right, down and to the left. You know, we have a bivariate data set, so you know, we see corresponding values of x and y, so to speak. This particular correlation perhaps would be indicative of, of a correlation of like positive 0.75. A perfect, a perfect positive correlation would look something like this. A correlation of positive 1 
would, would look something like this. Perfectly lined up set of bivariate data points, no dispersion, a correlation of zero, a correlation of zero an r equal to zero would look something like this. Just randomly scattered bivariate data points all over the place. No particular pattern. Pretty much total bivariate randomness, so to speak. So we see a pattern here, don't we? We see no relationship, aka total randomness, no particular pattern here. As correlations increase in strength, this being the strongest positive relationship, as correlations increase in strength, the data points become more and more constricted. This being the most constricted, right? This is a bit constricted. This is like just totally not constricted, okay? Characteristics of positive correlations. A typical negative correlation, a typical negative correlation would be the opposite, of course, of the positive correlation. A typical negative correlation in terms of a scatter plot might look like this. Again, we have this, you know, elliptical, you know, configuration, so to speak. There's a pattern to the data. There's a pattern because there's a relationship. In this case, we have a uh, you know, bivariate data points going up and to the right, down and to the left. We have data points going, uh, oh, excuse me, oh, that is wrong. Going up and to the left down and to the right, up and to the left, down and to the right. This particular correlation would be, hmm, we see a little bit more constriction here, don't we, here, than here. Maybe a little bit. Maybe this correlation is indicative of a Pearson R of like negative 0.8 or whatever. A perfect negative correlation, a perfect negative correlation, a correlation of negative one would look something like this. Perfectly lined up by various data points going up and to the left, down and to the right. So again, as correlations increase in strength, as we go from here, of course, which is no relationship, to as we, as we become, um, as the correlations become stronger, the data points, again, become more and more constricted, with this being the most constricted. Okay. Now. As correlations get stronger, as correlations increase in strength, as correlations get stronger, comma, it gives us the ability to predict
and I'm underlining and putting quotation marks. This is a, this is a key word. As correlations get stronger, as they increase in strength, it gives us the ability to predict y from x using a statistical technique called simple linear regression. Simple linear regression. Simple linear regression, the equation for the straight line, except this time we express it as y prime equals bx plus a. y prime equals bx plus a, we're real familiar with y equals mx plus b, right? Same thing. We know a is the y-intercept that point where the line crosses the y-axis, right? B is the slope. We know slope is rise over run. Remember that stuff? This y prime setup, this is not y in the practical sense of it. It's not y. It's y prime. y prime is referred to as the predicted y, the predicted y, or the predicted variable. The predicted variable, also called the dependent variable. is the predictor variable. The predictor variable, also called the independent variable. The independent variable. So these terms resurface again. And we have to remember something. I have to tell you guys something. In the experimental world, we talk about it the first class and, you know, and whatever, the experiments where we're trying to establish evidence for cause and effect. In the experimental world, the independent variable is that manipulated variable, you know, that treatment administered. The dependent variable is the outcome. We're looking for the effects of the independent variable on the dependent variable in, in the realm of experiments, right? So we have this whole world of experimental research over here. And then over here, we have the whole world of correlation and regression, which is looking for relationships and the ability to predict. In this world over here, the independent variable is the predictor the dependent variable is the predicted. Scientists are in the business of, of attempting to predict and explain phenomena. They're also in the business of trying to establish evidence for cause and effect. So scientists do experiments, but they also look for relationships between variables. And there's actually a link between those two worlds. There's a link between those two worlds. Okay, so guess what? We can draw a line right up the center of each one of these scatter plots, except for this one. And we call this line the regression line. This line, y prime equals bx plus a, we will be developing these equations, these simple equations next week. Okay, we have stuff to do today before we get to regression. This regression line has a couple other names. It's also called 
uh, the, the line of best fit, the line of best fit, also called the line of best prediction. The line of best prediction. It's called that because after we develop this equation, we can essentially pluck or extract any x data point out of the data set, plug it into the equation, and predict a y. Again, let me repeat that. After we develop this simple linear regression equation, we can essentially extract or pluck, pick, any x data point out of the data set, plug it into the equation, and predict a y. So over the years, I have amassed tons and tons of exam data, exam one and exam two, and I could develop, you know, I've developed an equation. So what I'm trying to say is that I can take any exam one score, plug it into the equation, and predict an exam two score. But I'm not predicting perfectly. I'm not predicting perfectly. Okay? I'm predicting with some error. I'm always predicting with some error. And this is what we call prediction error. Prediction error. Prediction error. This prediction error is nothing more, class, than this scatter. Prediction error is nothing more than that bivariate dispersion. So guess what? Here we have some prediction error, don't we? Yeah, because we have some dispersion. Here we have some prediction error because we have some dispersion. Here we have a lot of prediction error because we have a lot of dispersion. How much dispersion do we have here, class? None. We have the perfect ability to predict, which in the real world does not exist. We never get correlations of negative one or positive one unless we can, we can rig data. We can actually rig data to achieve that. But in the, the real world, because there's so much variation, we live in a world of variation. Because there's so much variation, we never get perfect positive or negative correlations. So we're always predicting with error. Now think of prediction error. Think of prediction error like um, uh, when it's hurricane season. Here we go. Great weather, weather example. Hurricane season. We're, we're on Channel 5 and we're watching Steve Weagle. Okay? And Steve's there and he's got, uh, or you know, we go to the Weather Channel, watch the girls on the Weather Channel. Kate Parker just moved over there, right, from Channel 5. Um, and what do we got? That error cone. And, you know, with that line right up the center, guess what that line is? It's the line of best prediction. It's telling us, yeah, you know, the, you know, uh, our best prediction is that the hurricane's going to go this way. But you know what? It might go this way, and, or it might go this way, depending on the interaction of a number of different variables, right? It's a pretty sophisticated prediction algorithm. It's actually called multiple regression. It's just the interaction of different variables to predict the direction of the hurricane. And we just pray that it doesn't come to the Treasure Coast, right? That's what, that's what we do, right? So we're always predicting with some error. Is the weather forecast a perfect prediction? No. Why? Because there's a lot of variables involved in predicting the weather. Okay. We actually have a measure of this prediction error. We, we have a measure of this bivariate dispersion that we call prediction error. It's called the standard error of the estimate. 
the standard error of the estimate. The standard error of the estimate. And it's a form of S. It's simply a form of S that is appropriate to the bivariate world. And it's actually abbreviated S subscript EST and then a large Y. And then there's a formula attached to it that I'm not even going to get into today. I just want you to know and be familiar with the name of this measure, this bivariate measure of prediction error. It's called the standard error of the estimate, and it's a form of S. And we know what S is. So what S is to the univariate world, you know, what that, that standard deviation is in the univariate world, the standard error of the estimate is in the bivariate world. So, like I said, as college students, your job is to, you know, attempt to assimilate this information. My job is to teach it to you. But what am I really doing? I'm preparing you for the exam, aren't I? Yeah. So let's have a little pop quiz now. I, I, have, I think you guys are all pretty bright. So let's have a pop quiz. Here we go. Okay. Question number one. Let's see, what could I ask you? What could I ask you? Oh, here's a good one. Here's a good one. Um, let's see. How much dispersion is here? So, you know what, guys? If I were to compute this standard error of the estimate, what would my answer be? It would be zero. Yeah. There's no dispersion here. You got that right. Let's try this again. All right. For this... Uh, perfect positive correlation of, of positive one. How much dispersion is there here? Zero. There's no dispersion. So you know what? If I were to compute this standard error of the estimate on this particular data set, what would it be? Zero. It would be zero. You got two out of two. Look at you. You got 100%. Now, would this standard error of the estimate, would it be really large or really small? Large. It would be really large. Yeah, why? Because we got a lot of error. Lots of error. We would get some figure for this data set and, of course, some figure for this. But what I want you to get out of this, the takeaway for this particular piece, is that as correlations increase in strength, both in the positive and negative sense, as correlations increase in strength, Prediction error decreases. Is that why they're considered stronger? Yeah, stronger ability to predict because we have less error. Exactly. Yeah. So as correlation strength increases, so does our ability to predict with less and less error. Okay, so as correlations get stronger, prediction error decreases. It's an inverse relationship. As correlations become weaker, prediction error increases. So it's a, you know, inverse relationship. You know, as correlation strength increases, error decreases. As correlation strength decreases, prediction error increases. Um, yes? Um, so you know when um, they, like, they interview people and they ask who are you going to vote for and they say this and this and this, and they said there's an error of plus and minus. Mm -hmm. why, why is there an error on that? Because they can't change your opinions or anything? Because there's, there's always a little bit of, you know, what they're doing is, this is inferential statistics, but it's called, it, it's, 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 a, it's a form of sampling error. Mm -hmm. And they're, when they're trying to actually take a set of sample information and then, um, you know, uh, make an inference of what the whole population is going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and you can never really accurately predict population sentiments from sample sentiments. You can do it. You can do a real strong prediction, but it's not a perfect prediction. That's why it's always you know, plus or minus three points. Because there's always a little bit of prediction error. Mm -hmm. There's always a little bit of that error. 
They can, you know, they can predict the pre uh, presidential election with, you know, pretty high accuracy, but not perfect accuracy. And that's why there's always that little plus or minus, mm -hmm. whatever. Okay, um, we can actually compute this uh, measure of relationship. We can compute this measure of relationship, this Pearson R, with a formula that looks like this. This happens to be the computational formula, computational formula for Pearson R. Now, there are really no surprises here, in, you know, in terms of these summation terms. We've got a lot of familiar stuff here. Look, we got some x and sum y. We have um, the sum x quantity squared and the sum x squared, stuff we're all familiar with. The sum y quantity squared and the sum y squared. Good old n. We have the sum of the products. These are actually forms of sums of squares. If you notice, what is this? Well, it's actually the numerator of the variance formula. This is a sum of squares relative to x. This is a sum of squares relative to y. This piece is a sum of squares relative to the product. So if you look in chapter 13, they will express it this way, the sum of squares xy over the sum of square, square root of this particular sum of squares times this particular sum of squares. Let's see how this works in a real example. And like I said, there are tons and tons and tons of pieces of correlational research out there in the real world. Here's one of them. This example is out of the um, uh, behavioral science, actually out of psychology. There were these two psychologists that were interested in determining if there is a relationship between creativity and ingenuity. Creativity and ingenuity. Now think, think of those two words, creativity and what, that, and what it is, and ingenuity in what it is. Now, I would think that those two terms are pretty similar. If you were to look their definitions up in Webster's Dictionary, they would be pretty similar. But how do you measure them? Can you measure creativity and ingenuity conventionally? No, it's, it's one of those intangibles. What do we gotta do? We have to operationalize it. We have to create an operational definition a.k.a. create scales. Well, they did this. They created a creativity scale and an ingenuity scale. They administered these scales to six individuals, 
variable x is creativity, variable y is ingenuity. They measured six individuals. And by the way, let me just ask you a quick question before we even get into this. What would you expect the correlation between creativity and ingenuity to be? Positive or negative? Positive. Yeah, I would think so. I would think as, as creativity scores increase, you know, ingenuity scores increase, and, and, and the opposite as well. Well, they measured six individuals. Here's what the bivariate data looks like. Creativity scores and ingenuity scores. Whenever you're presented with a data set, the first thing you do is look at it. I'm not trying to be facetious here. Okay, it's the first thing you do is look, you inspect it. Okay? So upon inspection of this bivariate data set, Look what's happening. Look at the numbers. We have x increasing. See that? Y simultaneously increasing. What is this? It's a positive correlation. Yeah, we can see it right here. We can see it. Our job now is to determine how strong this positive correlation is. We have to compute Pearson R to make that determination. We have some preliminary work to do before we can actually compute Pearson R. We have to get the data set ready to compute Pearson R. We have to square each X and Y data point and create the product. Six squared, 36. One, 100, 225, 400, 625. We square each x and y data point. 1 squared is 1. 0 squared, 0. 400, 625, 625, 625. And then we create the product, xy. 6 times 1, 6. 1 times 0, 0. 10 times 20, 200. 375, 500, 625. Square each x and y data point and create the product. Then we bring everything down to sum. We do a sum x. A sum x quantity squared, we do a sum x squared, we do a sum y, a sum y quantity squared, a sum y squared, and a sum xy. And again, in working with our calculators, just like when you're sending a text or doing a Facebook post and you want to get it perfect, you want to get spelling. I notice most of all Facebook posts, are, the spelling's perfect. So you take a little bit of time and you're careful, right? When you're working with the keys. Same thing with this. When you're doing these computations, you've got to be very, you have to get this perfect. Relax, don't rush through it. Make your keystrokes very deliberate on your calculators. You have to get this perfect or it's going to throw your numbers off. Sum x is 77. 
Sum x quantity squared is 5929. And I'm going to run through this example quickly. You're going to have an example for homework. Sum x squared, 1387. Sum x squared is 1387. Sum y is 96. 96 squared, 92.16. Sum y squared, 2.276. Sum xy, 17.06. Bring everything down to sum. Make sure you're nice and relaxed and you're doing deliberate keystrokes. And bring all the numbers down. Now we plug in to the computational formula for Pearson R. Our Pearson R is the sum xy, 1706, minus the uh, sum x, 77, times the sum y, uh, 96 over our n of 6, all over square root of this first piece right here, sum x squared, 1387, minus the sum x quantity squared, 5929, over our n of 6, Close the bracket, open up the next one. Sum y squared, 2276, minus the sum y quantity squared, 9216, over the um, n of 6. Close the bracket and solve. Now, very simply, it becomes this whole quantity subtracted from this, right? This whole quantity subtracted from this, this whole quantity subtracted from this. Remember that. Students sometimes get, sometimes get followed up in order of operations. Don't do that. So it's, you know, this quantity subtracted from this, this quantity subtracted from this, this quantity subtracted from this. So let's do that. Our Pearson R is um, 1706 minus this times this divided by this is 1232 all over the square root of, bring the radical down, this divided by this, and then all subtracted from this, is 398.83. And then this divided by this, all subtracted from this, is 740. And we bring it down, our Pearson R. Our numerator is 474 all over square root of this product, this times this, 295134.2. And we just keep it going. Our Pearson R, 474 numerator all over the square root of this number which is 543.26. Our Pearson R, in this case, is positive 0.87. Positive 0.87. We've detected a fairly strong positive relationship between x and y. We've detected a fairly strong positive relationship between creativity and ingenuity. That would be our interpretation. It's a simple interpretation. 
We could actually plot these six bivariate data points in a scatter plot, but let's pretend instead that we just have many, many more of these bivariate data points to produce a correlation of positive 0.87. The scatter plot would look something like this. Data points going up and to the right, down and to the left, pretty tightly constricted, with a regression line going right up the center. That is a typical scatter plot for a, a correlation of this positive magnitude. Pretty strong, therefore the data points are pretty constricted. It's not a perfect correlation, not a perfect positive correlation, but pretty doggone strong. Regardless, once we develop this simple linear regression equation, which we're going to do next week, we can essentially, you know, extract any x data point out of the data set, plug it into the equation, and predict a y. But we're not predicting perfectly, are we? What do we, what do we always have? We have prediction error. error. And that error is simply this dispersion. OK. I'd like to talk about another measure called the coefficient of determination. The coefficient of determination, or r squared. Could somebody square r for me, please? Okay, let's call it 0 0.76. 0.76. So 0.87 squared is 0.76. The coefficient of determination is thought of as the amount of shared variation between x and y. The coefficient of determination is the amount of variation x and y have in common. It's so the amount of variation x and y have in common. It's thought of as the amount of shared variation between x and y. the amount of shared variation between x and y. A, a, a typical way of looking at this is just to draw a Venn diagram where we have x and then we have y. This area in the middle is the amount of shared variation, r squared. Now there's a method of interpreting this that is actually in every intro stat course, textbook, whatever you want to call it. We take this number, which in this case is 0.76 or 76%, and we say 76% of the variation in y can be explained or predicted by the variation in x. In this case, 76% of the variation in y 
can be explained or predicted by the variation in x. Well, this is a, a, a pretty standard interpretation for r squared. 76% variation overlap, so to speak. The amount of variation that x and y have in common. We notice that creativity and ingenuity are pretty similar, pretty doggone similar. They're not identical, but they're pretty, they're, they're, they're essentially measuring almost the same thing. We have another measure, we have another measure called the coefficient of non-determination. The coefficient of non-determination, or 1 minus r squared. 1 minus r squared, in this case, 1 minus 0.76 is 0.24. The coefficient of non-determination is considered the amount of variation x and y don't have in common. the amount of variation x and y don't have in common, or perhaps the amount of unshared variation between x and y. The amount of unshared variation between x and y. So interpretationally, and you will do this on the exam, you will do this on the exam, interpretationally you would take this number and you would say 24% of the variation in y cannot be explained or predicted by the variation in x. Twenty-four percent of the variation in y cannot be explained or predicted by the variation in x. Don't let this intimidate you. Let's just take a look at what we've done. Remember, keep it simple. We have a bivariate data set measuring for the relationship between creativity and ingenuity. We actually did that, did that measurement. We determined that we have a pretty strong positive relationship between these two variables. With about 76% shared variation and about 24% unshared variation. So we've computed the measure of relationship and we've interpreted We've computed the measure of shared variation, and we've interpreted. And we've computed the measure of unshared variation, and we've interpreted. This is, this is the stuff. This is, this is correlation. Bless you. Do you think you can do this? Of course you can. So let's talk about that. Yes? Do you have to memorize that formula? No, actually you'll be provided with formula sheet. No, no memorization of formulas. Okay. No, no. Um, let's suppose, in fact, let's um, talk about another example. 
This particular example is out of the world of business. Business, in fact, human resources. These researchers were looking for a relationship between employee evaluation scores, employee evaluation scores, employee evaluation scores, and the number of days late to work. Employee evaluation scores and the number of days late to work. Think about it. When you're late to work a lot, or you're late to class a lot, how does that make the boss feel? Not real good. So, let's think about correlation. Here, let's, let's do this whole deal. As um, the number of days late to work increases, what do you think happens to employee evaluation scores? And what is this? Let's take a look at the numbers. Let's take a look at the data. The first thing you do when you're presented with a data set is look at it. And again, that sounds funny, but it's true. Let's inspect this data. Look, it's obvious. X is decreasing. What's happening to Y, class? Increasing. It's increasing. What is this indicative of? A negative correlation. Our job now is to determine how strong this negative correlation is going to be. Your assignment, which we will begin uh, first thing next week, I want you to compute R and interpret. Compute R and interpret, just like we did here. Then, I would like you to compute that coefficient of determination, which we know is what? R squared, yep, and interpret. Then, I would like you to compute the coefficient of non-determination, And we know that to be 1 minus r squared, right? And I'd like you to interpret. Just like we did here and here, and also here with our Pearson r. We will um, pick that up. I will tell you, though, that Pearson r ends up being negative 0.78 for this homework, just so you know. You get this answer, this, this pretty high negative correlation, you, you got it right. Follow the procedure, just like we did. Square each x and y data point, create the product, bring everything down to sum, compute Pearson R, and interpret. And that concludes this particular lecture on uh, correlation. See you next time. <laughs>